Welcome to Human Monsters. Little is known about the origins of Jeremy Brian Jones. He was born in 1973. He's a native of Miami, Oklahoma. Jones's violent tendencies emerged early and were documented in January 1990 when he was charged with assault at the age of 16. The incident in question was instigated when a woman arrived at her son's school and saw that he was engaged in fisticuffs with another boy. That boy was Jeremy Brian Jones. Jones was winning, really pummeling her son. She rushed up to them to break up the fight. Not only did Jones not stop beating up the boy, but he was so infuriated by the interruption He forgot about her son and began to lash out at the mother, beating her viciously. This fight was broken up by police, and Jones was promptly charged with assault and battery. Needless to say, when Jones was riled up, nothing and nobody could stop him from attacking the oppositional force. After serving time in a juvenile detention facility, Jones was enrolled in Copa High School. He was remembered for being an outspoken and belligerent rebel who constantly talked back to his teachers. Despite this recalcitrant behavior, he managed to refrain from engaging in physical violence for a time. During his time in high school, Jones developed a penchant and finely honed skill for manipulating others. He applied these techniques most frequently and successfully with girls. Girls who were acquainted with him at that time recalled that he could be very charming. In fact, one such girl fell in puppy love, as she put it. Even her mother was taken with Jeremy and encouraged her daughter to take him up on an offer of marriage should he have extended that invitation her way, which he did not. Beyond females, Jeremy built up a large social circle due to his top-notch social skills, and by all accounts, he was highly regarded by his friends. There was one dark secret of which some of his friends were unaware. Jeremy tried methamphetamine, and his usage became habitual. Years later, Jones would describe his use of the drug as being a key factor in his downfall and criminal behavior. He would go on benders, leading him to hallucinate and become extremely paranoid. May 11, 1992 Jeremy Jones had dropped out of school and did little else with his time but take methamphetamine and lurk aimlessly. At one point, he encountered 20-year-old Jennifer Judd. She was married to a man named Justin. She was on her way to run some errands. One of the errands consisted of bringing her husband's lunch to his place of employment. She never showed up. When Justin returned home after wondering where his wife had been, he was shocked and horrified by what he saw when he walked into his apartment. Jennifer's body was sprawled out over the kitchen floor, marinating in an ocean of blood. She had been badly beaten, with bruises, cuts, and welts present all over her body. Autumn 1995 Jeremy Jones was booked for sexual assault. As police were documenting the arrest and charges, Another rape attributed to Jones was reported to the investigators. At this point, Jeremy Jones was on a bender, with no indication that he was going to quit any time soon. The drug fueled him into a violent psychosis. Nobody was entirely safe in his presence, and he could be quite pugnacious at times in hopes that someone would take him on. The new rape report had it that Jones held a gun at a woman's vagina. As he did so, he told her he was going to kill her. He spared her life 
but he still raped her. Jones used his charm and slick way with words on the detectives. He convinced them that he was a suitable candidate for a program that worked with young offenders. The program deferred sentencing, focusing instead on rehabilitation. They were sold. Instead of going to prison immediately, he was remanded to the Dick Connor Correctional Center for evaluation. At Dick Connor Correctional Center, Jones employed his charisma and gift of gab as he spoke with the staff who evaluated him. He sold himself as a troubled young man who was disturbed by his actions. He also emphasized his drug addiction as a catalytic factor in his violent behavior. He convinced the staff that he was an ideal candidate for treatment. They believed he was indeed a lost and troubled young man, and that if he quit his drug habit, he could be successfully reintegrated into law-abiding society. His mother, Jeannie Beard, testified as a character witness during his trial. She insisted to the court that he was a nice boy, who came from a loving, upstanding family. She promised that if he were given a chance at redemption, he would have a strong family network that would ensure he would stay out of trouble and off drugs. It worked. Prison officials decided Jeremy Jones was worthy of another stab at a straight-edged life. He was caught lying during his assessment a few times, though the staff attributed the historical inaccuracies to the impact his heavy drug use had on his memory. February 21st, 1996. Grove, Oklahoma. Daniel Oakley and Doris Harris were viciously slaughtered before their home was set on fire. When the firefighters found the bodies, it took no time at all to discern that their deaths had nothing to do with smoke inhalation or other fire-related injuries. Each of them was shot several times. There was a trail of blood leading up to the corpses, which bubbled and burned as the flames devoured their home. Due to the extensive fire damage... There was little detectives could obtain from the scene that would beat a DNA path to a suspect. Jeremy Jones impressed the staff of the correctional facility at which he resided. He complied with all the rules and regulations. At one point, he received a report that noted a satisfactory level of progress. He served the rest of his sentence on probation, receiving five years. He pled no contest to his previous sexual assault convictions. There was a catch for making the plea deal. He was required to submit his DNA to a national database. He was also issued a schedule for reporting back to the facility for group therapy sessions. The therapy was oriented toward reforming sex offenders. Jones initially attended the meetings faithfully, but eventually he found the meetings intolerable. He even became confrontational with the ringleaders. He groused to his mother about how much he hated listening to what, quote, a bunch of perverts had to say. He didn't see himself as a pervert. Ultimately, rape meant something else to him entirely. Eventually, Jones was kicked out of the group. Some people died throughout the state of Oklahoma in the 1990s under mysterious circumstances. On September 11, 1999, Justin Hutchins was found dead by what was presumed to be a drug overdose. His family insisted to police and anybody else who would listen that Justin was straight-laced and never did drugs. They considered his death to be suspicious and chalked it up to foul play. The police did not take this theory seriously and stuck with the drug narrative. In the township of Welch, two young women named Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman went missing on December 30, 1999. They had just celebrated Ashley's 16th birthday. 
They were best friends, having emerged in the same rural culture of living off the grid and off the land. Ashley's parents were found murdered at their home. Their house was set on fire. By the time firefighters reached the scene, the house was reduced to kindling. Ashley's mother, Kathy, was the first victim found in the wreckage. The firefighters knew immediately that the fire was no accident when they inspected the condition of Kathy's body. She was naked, and there was a gunshot wound on her head. Danny Freeman, Kathy's husband, his remains were found the next day under the rubble. His body had been burned extensively. He had been shot several times. Community volunteers spread out through the landscape in search of Ashley and Laura, but their bodies were not located. Jeremy Jones was not complying with the conditions of his parole agreement. Not only was he still not undergoing treatment for his deviant sexuality, but he was doing meth again. Taking this into consideration, police issued a warrant for Jones' arrest on October 19, 2000. When Jones found out, he went on the lam. He disappeared and changed his name and identity. Jeremy Jones decided the only way to shake Oklahoma authorities off his tail was to flee the state. He took a bus to Alabama. He had some friends in the state, and he hoped that he could charm them into letting him stay at their homes. Before he left, he met an older woman in a bar. He sold her a story about how he had been framed and railroaded by the justice system. The woman was sympathetic as she had a son who was doing time in prison. Somehow Jones was able to convince this woman to give him her son's identity. According to Jones, she put up no resistance when he asked for her son's social security number and name, that being John Paul Chapman. Many believe this story is too far-fetched to be believed. Jones has said he can talk the pants off any woman. He was able to deceive police as a silver-tongued devil, so it's in the realm of possibility. However the identity came into his possession, he assumed the identity of John Paul Chapman from that point onward. It meant he could apply for jobs in Alabama without attracting attention from law enforcement. A bounty hunter pursued Jones all the way to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, but lost his trail when Jones migrated to Mobile. Once he settled in Mobile, Jones approached Mark Bentley for a job with his construction company. Bentley was always looking for more hands, so he was happy to hire him. Jones would first be required to pass a drug test. Jones passed the drug test and began work. Bentley helped him find a place to live. Jones was a model employee, showing up early and working hard. He ingratiated himself to his co-workers and was well received. He also worked his magic on young women who visited the site. They recalled his charming smile and sweet-talking flattery. Meanwhile, parole officers visited his mother to question her about Jeremy's whereabouts. She lied. Now that he had money in his pocket, Jeremy Jones was in the market for meth. Eventually, his use of the drug began to affect his behavior at work, both in terms of the quality of his efforts and his interpersonal relationships with his colleagues. He became irritable and short-tempered. Nobody on meth should be trusted around heavy machinery. He was fired. From the last moment of his last shift, Jones made a beeline for a hotel. It was at the hotel where Jones met a man named Craig Baxter. Baxter was a visitor to Mobile at the time. He was actually from Georgia. He was only immobile while working a temporary job. After Jones fed Baxter a well-concocted sob story, Baxter felt pity for him. He gave Jones his phone number and encouraged him to call if he ever found his way to Georgia. Baxter didn't seriously expect that Jeremy Jones would move from another state to take him up on his offer of alms. 
Jones called him up and had a new sob story. This time it involved being a victim of assault and robbery. Instead of reporting the incident to the police, Jeremy appealed to Craig for financial assistance. Ultimately, Craig decided the right thing to do was to help out the man who was so down on his luck. He wired Jones some money. The money sent to Jones was spent on transportation, straight to Baxter's door. It was a complete surprise. Craig was kind enough to let Jeremy live in his basement until he got his life back on track. During his first few days in Baxter's house, Jones presented as a hard-working and pleasant young man who was grateful and eager to please. Eventually, however, Jones began doing meth again, and that, combined with his dishonest behavior, rubbed Craig's wife Jan the wrong way. She pressured Craig to throw Jeremy out. It didn't help that Jeremy hadn't paid any rent, and there was no sign that he would contribute any time soon. After wearing out his welcome in the Baxter household, Jeremy Jones ingratiated himself to Baxter's neighbor, John McIntosh. He was so taken with the young man, he used his connections at a refinery in Douglasville, Georgia, to get Jones a job. Jones passed the background check because he was still identifying as John Chapman. As with the construction business, Jones endeared himself to his co-workers and impressed the team with his competency and work ethic. Not everybody fell under Jeremy's spell. In fact, John McIntosh's wife, Carrie, took a disliking to him. Jeremy became John's primary confidant and always sided with him when John and Carrie fought. She wondered what his motives as an interloper really were. Halloween 2002. Jeremy Jones was restless with mischief. He had behaved himself for a long time, but it was a facade, and more and more poorly sustained as time went by. After helping John McIntosh's son prep for the occasion by applying makeup to his face to resemble a member of the band Kiss, Jones made tracks for a bar located in Douglasville called Gibson's. The bar was packed, ass to crotch. One patron in particular, 38-year-old Tina Mayberry, attracted attention in her costume as the cartoon character Betty Boop. If she was hoping to elicit the amorous attentions of the male attendees, she succeeded, though not in a way that she would have intended. Just before midnight, she was discovered outside the bar, on the ground. She was bloodied and bashed. Her executioner stabbed her. Investigators determined that she kept up a fight and may have held her own for a time. Speculation had it that she died outside the bar because she was hoping someone would alert first responders. She was pronounced DOA in hospital. Meanwhile, John and Carrie McIntosh found more of Jeremy Jones's behavior concerning. They didn't get in the way when Jones engaged in womanizing, but one night John heard a scream coming from Jeremy's room. Jeremy's female guest ran out of the room. Jeremy insisted it was just a misunderstanding due to excessive alcohol intake. John took him at his word and forgot about the incident. The next day, the police came knocking. They were inquiring about an incident involving an attempt at rape. Jones knew that to refuse cooperation with the investigation would arouse suspicion, so he went to the police station for questioning. John McIntosh agreed to accompany him. John vouched for his friend's good character. Ultimately, the police decided to put the matter to rest. The girl admitted to having been drunk and she was never raped. They accepted that it really was a drunken misunderstanding and charges were not filed. This was too much for Carrie and John. Now that the police had darkened their door, John informed Jeremy that it was time for him to leave. Jeremy begged and pleaded the couple to give him another chance. He said that not only would he endeavor to get his life in order, but he would give up his promiscuity and find a woman with whom to settle down. 
Making good on that last promise, Jeremy Jones went out to Gibson's one evening and met a woman named Vicki Freeman. According to Freeman, this young man who introduced himself as John Paul Chapman walked up to her and her friend, flashed his prize-winning smile, and told her he couldn't help but notice how beautiful she was. After a brief conversation, Jones walked away. Normally, informing a woman she is beautiful is a poorly received tactic, especially when utilized by men who have far less charisma and social acumen. Fortunately for Jones, he had a certain je ne sais quoi, and Vicky was intrigued. Later that evening, Jones and Freeman reconnected, and now she was hooked. As she put it, she was just lost in him. They began to see each other regularly. By autumn 2003, they were living together. Vicky's apartment was situated in Villa Rica, Georgia. Jones's behavioral record during his time there was not without notable incidents. He was charged with public indecency for exposing himself. He showed his unsolicited genitals to one of Vicky's neighbors. The victim was 18-year-old Brittany Godfrey. Jones's attraction to Brittany escalated into obsession. He would harass her when he knew she was home alone, but she would not answer the door. On many occasions, he would pull a chair up to the door and sit at the door, waiting for her to emerge. He would be sitting there ranting and raving to himself incoherently. At this point, he was back on meth, and he was not staggering his intake. It culminated in him exposing his package to Brittany. Her parents called the police when they were notified about his actions. He was arrested as John Paul Chapman. He was able to pay his bail and was released. Meanwhile, the Godfreys made a chilling new discovery germane to Jones's stalking of their daughter. They found a box in reaching distance of Brittany's window. The contents, rope, tape, and a pair of binoculars. February 14, 2004, New Orleans, Louisiana. The corpse of a woman was found. She had been brutally raped and assaulted. She was found in the French Quarter and was assumed to have been one of the many prostitutes who worked the red light district. Some detectives noticed that there were some notable similarities to some other murders that had been committed in that region. This woman was found to have been killed by severe blunt trauma, most likely from being struck by a tire iron. Other victims had been dispatched in a similar fashion. Perhaps it was too early in the investigation to jump to conclusions and announce a serial killer was to blame, but one couldn't rule out the possibility entirely. A month later, Jeremy Jones and his then fiance Vicky, moved out of their apartment. Their neighbors were creeped out by him and were relieved to see him go. Jones and Freeman moved to the Arbor Village Trailer Park, located near Douglasville, Georgia. March 12, 2004. 16-year-old Amanda Greenwell was a resident of Arbor Village, on this day, Amanda left her family's home to make a call at a payphone. She never returned. Amanda's father, Rick Greenwell, reported Amanda's disappearance to police. They searched the area but found no sign of her. They suggested that maybe she decided to run away, but her father rejected this notion insisting it was implausible giving the girl's character as a pleasant and well-adjusted individual. Unable to cast further doubt on Greenwell's assessment of the situation, the police opined that Amanda's disappearance was most likely the result of an abduction. The police interviewed all residents of Arbor Village. Among them was Jeremy Jones, identifying as John Paul Chapman. He told them everything he figured they would want to hear. It worked. They ruled him out as a suspect. They were unaware that he was out on bail for exposing himself to a young girl. The search did not yield the desired results, and the case went cold. 
April 20th. The case was reopened. Amanda's remains were found in a forest located close to Arbor Village. Though her body was in an advanced stage of decomposition, the pathologist was able to ascertain that she was killed with a knife. Pressure was placed on her throat to the point that it was broken by the impact. Whether she died from stab wounds or strangulation was undeterminable. There were still no leads on a suspect. Another local woman was found dead, this being the remains of Patrice Tambor Andres. Her body was found soon after Amanda Greenwell's was discovered. Patrice was well known in the small community for being the proprietor of a successful hair salon called Tambor's Trim and Tan. She was reported missing on April 15, 2004. She was remembered for being an ambitious, committed, and hard-working woman and was not known to play hooky. When her customers showed up to find that the shop was closed, they became concerned and reported her disappearance. As it happened, Patrice finished up with a client at about 11.38 a.m. She stepped outside for a meal break. At 12.03 p.m., when her next customer arrived, Patrice was in absentia. In fact, not only was she nowhere to be found, but her car remained at the location. This information was reported to police and an investigation began. When police examined her car, they found her purse. It had been picked clean of cash. The cash register in the salon had also been cleared out. The police treated the case as a robbery. Patrice Andres possessed physical attributes common among the other females reported missing and murdered in the aforementioned cases. She was petite, with long, dark hair, dark eyes, and very attractive. Jeremy Brian Jones was in a wretched state. He contacted John McIntosh and filled him in on the moral and personal squalor in which he was mired. He said his life was a wreck. He said he had, quote, screwed up. He was cryptic about the source of these problems. John assumed he was referring to his ongoing addiction to methamphetamine. As Jones went on, it occurred to John that something far worse factored into the deterioration of Jones's quality of life. Jones's addiction to meth was, nevertheless, still a serious problem in his life, so much so that he was arrested for possession. He was unable to make bail and remained behind bars. While Jones was booked for the crime as John Paul Chapman, his fingerprints did not match up with prints attributed to Jeremy Brian Jones. Once again, he avoided the attention of Oklahoma's parole officers. After a week in jail, Jones was sent free. Immediately after, he went to the home of his former friend and boss, Mark Bentley. He begged him for a home and a job. Bentley had forgiven him for his prior transgressions and let him stay at his house. Jeremy contacted Vicky and told her about his plans to begin work. She told him to look for a new place to live and she would join him when possible. That very day, Lisa Nichols, a neighbor of Mark Bentley, was attacked. After being raped and murdered, her home was set on fire. Unfortunately for her two daughters, Amber and Jennifer, they were the ones who found Lisa's remains amid the wreckage. Detectives interviewed anybody who interacted with Lisa Nichols on a regular basis. Someone did observe some unusual activity on the day of her death that involved an unrecognized vehicle. The witness even remembered a portion of the vehicle's license plate number. Mark Bentley was interviewed. He was asked about the vehicle in question. When asked if he knew the owner, he indicated that it belonged to his employee and tenant, John Paul Chapman. He was even more helpful, providing the man's social security number and date of birth. A search for John Paul Chapman was underway. John Paul Chapman, a.k.a. Jeremy Brian Jones, did the unexpected and, given his history, unthinkable. 
he contacted the police of his own volition. He spoke to police on the phone. The call was recorded. He rambled incessantly and without premise. They traced the call to its origin, and he was placed under arrest by force. Jeremy Brian Jones was remanded to Mobile Metro Jail. He was booked and charged with robbery, rape, and murder. This time he would not be able to sweet-talk his way out of jail. The investigators did still believe his real name was John Paul Chapman, however. The alias no longer held up once police discovered that a man with that name was at that time incarcerated in Missouri. The police hadn't gotten anything incriminating out of Jones yet, so they continued to monitor him closely. He slipped up when he made a call from a prison payphone to his mother. The call was monitored and traced, and when the identity of his mother as Oklahoma resident Jeannie Beard was confirmed, everything began to unravel for Jeremy Brian Jones. Jones was served a warrant for violating his parole. Vicki Freeman was understandably shocked to learn that her fiancé had a record for violent attacks and sexual assault. She was so blinded by her love for him that even after his arrest for indecent exposure, she could never quite have imagined that he was capable of much worse. She wasn't exactly thrilled that he had been lying to her about his identity. To quote Vicky, Never in my wildest dreams would I imagine he would be capable of this, until they called and told me he wasn't even who he said he was. Nevertheless, she did not withdraw her support for Jones. Whenever someone suggested he had been abusive, she was quick to retaliate verbally. She refused to divulge the more private details of their relationship. At one point, she said she brought herself to a point where she had forgiven Jeremy and her love for him outlived his criminal history to that date. Vicky and Jeremy spoke on the phone while he was still in custody. He used his gift of gab to convince her he was innocent. It was effective. Vicky began to insist to anybody who cared to listen that Jones was being framed. She linked up with Jeannie Beard and forged a union with their love for and loyalty to Jeremy as its foundation. They would visit him in jail together. The investigation into Jeremy Jones's criminal behavior continued. He was considered as a candidate for the unknown perpetrator of several unsolved murders. Law enforcement agencies in disparate counties and states were exchanging information. The common denominators began to emerge, and not only did they connect the dots into a portrait of a serial killer, but the lens pointing at Jeremy Brian Jones as a suspect was adjusted more clearly into focus. Jeremy Jones didn't divulge much information during the introductory phases of questioning. However, as detectives introduced more and more evidence and accusations into the conversation, Jones began to open up. In fact, the truth of Jones's criminal history was like an overdue pregnancy at this point, and he could suppress the truth no longer. First, details of the murder of Tina Mabry were verified. He provided details that only the murderer would know. The same was true of his description of the murder of Amanda Greenwell. More circumstantial evidence emerged when authorities discovered that Jones rented a storage unit in Douglas County. When the unit was searched by police, numerous photographs of eight women were found, and they all matched the descriptions of the noted victims. The women all bore the trademarks of Jones's victims, beautiful with pleasing figures and long raven black hair. The police issued the images to the public to see if anybody would step forward and identify them. They also wanted to find out about the nature of their relationship, or lack thereof, with Jeremy Brian Jones. None of the women were counted among the victims. One damning item retrieved from the storage unit was a ring that had belonged to Amanda Greenwell. Another break in the investigation came from Vicki Friedman 
when she was questioned. She reported that on the day of Amanda Greenwell's disappearance, Jeremy came home with scratches on him. He was also covered with mud. He didn't explain what had happened to him, and she didn't inquire. Eventually, police prevailed upon Vicky, and she dispensed with her loyalty to Jeremy. When she asked detectives why he changed his identity, they told her it was to avoid being prosecuted for rape charges. She was no longer love blind. She blurted out, Oh no, he did it. He did it. She was still capricious about the possibility of his guilt, and her position on the issue would waver for a while. Among the other accusations of murder, Jeremy Jones was now the prime suspect in the murder of Catherine Collins, the 47-year-old prostitute that was killed in New Orleans. A traffic ticket was issued to him in New Orleans at the time the murder was committed, and a man remembered seeing Jones at a truck stop in the city at that time. Jones revealed details about Collins' demise that only the murderer would know. He said he stabbed her in the eye before slamming the hilt of the blade into her mouth, knocking out several teeth. He finished her off by mutilating her vagina with his knife after she was dead. These details were consistent with the findings of the autopsy. Detectives noted that a change came over Jones as he described the murders. After having been friendly and relatable with the officers, a dark expression emerged on his face and he got a wild look in his eyes. The way Jones told it, he went to New Orleans with the intention of celebrating Mardi Gras. He was jacked up on meth the entire time. When he met Catherine Collins, they went to what he described as an abandoned drug house. After she disrobed, he had second thoughts about the transaction. She became angry that he was hesitating, and it led to an argument. According to him, she ran stark naked out of the house, and he chased after her, knife in hand. When he caught up with her, he tackled her and planted her on the ground. He stabbed her. When the detectives inquired about a motive, Jones said, The bitch deserved it. Jones confessed to the killing of Patrice Andres. He told police where her body was dumped. However, the police went to the site and found that her body was not there. Jones said he was doing so much meth at the time he killed her that he may not have remembered the location clearly. The story of her murder, as Jones told it, was that he was cruising aimlessly in his car when he stopped at the salon on a whim. When he went inside to ask Patrice for directions, he suddenly realized they were alone together. It dawned on him that it would be an ideal occasion to strike out against her. He grabbed Andres and dragged her outside, where he raped and killed her. He placed her corpse in his car. He drove to a bridge nearby and tossed it into Sweetwater Creek, located near Chattahoochee River, where he dumped some of his other victims. Jones confessed to killing Danny and Kathy Freeman because they owed money to his friend. He said they owed him thousands of dollars. His friend didn't even put him up to it. He simply believed that people should pay their debts, like he was a one-man mafia. He rushed into their trailer, gun in hand. He shot the couple and poured gasoline on a pile of clothes before setting it on fire. He ran back to his truck to watch the house burn. There was still no explanation about why Kathy Freeman was found nude. He said that Ashley and Laura approached him and asked him what had caused the fire. It didn't occur to them that he might be responsible. They assumed he was a good Samaritan who spotted the fire from the road and stopped to see how he could intervene. He drove the girls to a remote area of forest. He raped one of them and followed up by killing both. He said he dumped their bodies in what he referred to as a mine pit. As with other cases, he said he was so high on meth, his account of the dumping location might not be reliable. His attorney urged him not to disclose so many details to police. When speaking with journalists, his lawyer opined that his client was mentally ill due to the lingering effects of methamphetamine abuse. 
Sometimes that's all you can do when your client won't listen to you. October 27th, 2005. The day of Jeremy Brian Jones' pre-trial hearing. Jones claimed that he and Lisa Nichols had consensual sex and used meth together. He said she died from an overdose and that his actions after the fact were carried out to create the illusion that her death could be attributed to some other factor. He said he shot her and set her on fire for that reason. The judge didn't buy it. Jones's attorney didn't help much either when he said, It's not that much of a crime to shoot a dead person. It's now a thing. That didn't exactly endear the lawyer to the court. Relatives of the deceased stormed out, outraged and disgusted by his words. Jones's lawyer later insisted that one possible catalyst for Jones's behavior was a medication he was issued in prison called Risperdal, which is an antipsychotic used to treat disorders like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. It was used to reinforce his point that Jones's statements should not be admissible in court. He also asserted his belief that Jones confessed to the crimes to earn extra privileges in jail. Jeremy Brian Jones was indicted by the grand jury for the sexual assault and murder of Lisa Nichols. May 10, 2005. Jones's arraignment. Despite all his confessions, Jones entered a plea of not guilty. His lawyer requested that Jones be evaluated by a psychiatrist. Even Jones didn't cotton to this idea, demonstrated when he shouted, I ain't crazy. Jones rejected this proposal and he was deemed competent to stand trial. During the trial, the prosecutor confronted Jones on the things he said during his confessions. Jones said those statements shouldn't be taken seriously because he was lying. The prosecutor said, you're always lying. Aiming for comic relief, Jones said, except under oath. Though his response elicited some laughter throughout the courtroom, the jury were not sufficiently amused to acquit him. After two hours of deliberation, they returned with a guilty verdict. At that point, Jones was bound either for death row or life in prison. Either way, he would never be a free man again. Now that he had nothing to lose and redemption was beyond his reach, he opened up about his involvement with other killings. Danny Oakley and Doris Harris on February 21st, 1996. Justin Hutchins on September 11th, 1999. As Jones tells it, he gave Justin what he referred to as a hot shot, an injection of meth mixed with other unspecified drugs, which triggered cardiac arrest. He alleged that he may have murdered four or five hookers in and around Atlanta during one of his meth benders, but there was no evidence to substantiate this claim. December 1, 2005. Jeremy Brian Jones was brought before Judge Charles Graddick for sentencing. Jones was given an opportunity to make a statement. He condemned all who were involved in his prosecution. He insisted he was innocent, and all his confessions were false. He looked Graddick in the eye and said that for executing a so-called innocent man, he would, quote, reap God's anger. He said to Graddick, you shall surely be put to death. Judge Graddick wasn't rattled. He reminded the court of the brutality Jones visited upon his victims. He declared that Jones was a serious, quote, threat to society. Jeremy Brian Jones was sentenced to death via lethal injection. He remains on death row in Alabama to this day. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.